day on this fine Sunday morning and I just want to thank um, the band Jorgen Ryan just for just positioning our minds and our hearts and to focus on what needs to be focused on and just the encouragement we have from God through Jesus Christ. We of all people, men and women, uh, are a hopeful people, right? We don't go through this life as those who have no hope. We're the opposite. We're the most hopeful people, right? And so everything this morning up to this point has helped us realign our hearts and our minds. No matter what has happened during the week, we come together this first day of the week to be reminded of God's great love for us. Because if God's for us, who could be against us? Right? If God's for us, who's going to be against us? No one. No one, no one, no one. Genesis 3 is where we're going to be this morning, and we're going to continue in the spirit of being reminded of who we are, more importantly, who God is, what he has given to us, what he has promised to us. Uh, but it doesn't come without struggle or difficulty. That's the realization of it all. Let me start by sharing a um, story of Brandy Chastain with us. She is a retired soccer star. Here's her picture. Very well known in the, in the soccer world. Amazing athlete. And uh, a couple weeks ago, Someone put together a, 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 a plaque to memorialize her as an athlete. And so the unveiling of the plaque happened, and boy, it caused an uproar. Not just in the sports world, but just the world in general. Because here's Brandy. Here's a picture of here. Here's what the plaque looked like once they put it on display. Um, I mean, here's the thing. The Twitterverse lit up like crazy. And they compared the likeness to former President Jimmy Carter. Um, they compared her to actor Gary Busey. Um, they said she perhaps looked like old baseball player Babe Ruth. Um, maybe there's a little Bill Belichick in there somewhere. Uh, maybe even Miss Doubtfire, played by Robin Williams, right? All I know is that you see the picture of Brandy, and then you see this, and there's a total disconnect. Her image was marred in this plaque and she's such a gracious person person she looked at the plaque and she said it's nice and with a smile on her face but everyone knew it was the wrong plaque to memorialize this great soccer athlete so even though it's going to be expensive they're going to actually produce a plaque that looks more like the likeness of brandy chastain and and we're familiar with marred images i mean this is what we've been talking about we know as humanity in general, our likeness and the representation of who we are as humans in this world is marred and doesn't look like what it ought to look like. We have had the image of who we are as humanity and the image of God stamped on our humanity marred by this one thing we call sin. And as we've been navigating the book of Genesis, there's one thing we've come to realize is that sin has wreaked havoc in our lives, in our relationship with God, in our relationship with one another, in our relationship with creation, things are not the way they are supposed to be. And it's because Adam and Eve, man, woman in the garden, exercised their free will and in their free choosing chose to rebel against God's divine order of things and thus catapulted all of humanity into this desperate situation we call sin, what we call now the image of God marred in our lives. And we all know there's an echo of what ought to be that isn't present. We look around our world, we look at our relationship with God, we look at our relationship with each other and go, there's got to be more. This has got to look differently. And this is the great cost of which God is, is pursuing men and women to make us more into the likeness of Christ because only through Christ and in his likeness can we become what we are created to be. And there's the answer. The answer is that the price of redoing the image of God in us came through the cross, came through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Everything we've been singing about this morning, everything we've been pointing to up to this point, we're going to continue to understand this. 
that the image of God that has been marred by sin is being restored by God through Jesus. Amen. And so this morning we turn to Genesis 3. We'll continue in looking at this narrative, this account, um, and how it impacts us today. That God is up to something. That there's a good work happening. We should be encouraged. Even though, like I said, the work doesn't come without struggle. The work that God wants to perform doesn't come without pain and it doesn't come without suffering. And so we're going to see the, the, the consequences of early man and woman's sin and what sort of action God is going to take to restore that image in and through his son in our lives. And so Genesis 3 is where we pick up the account starting at verse 14. So let me just get you up to speed, right? The, the serpent has come into the, into the garden, and I take serpent to mean title of Satan, not necessarily an animal in the animal kingdom. And I want you to know that the, the serpent, i.e. Satan or Lucifer, most beautiful of what God had created, he is a, he's a, 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 an angel of light, beautiful. And literally the word serpent means one who is shining or the shining one. And through his brilliance, enticed Eve to eat what was forbidden, thus leading her husband, Adam, to do the same, plunging now humanity into this corrupt state. And now God comes and seeks out Adam and Eve. He didn't have to do it, but he takes the initiative to seek them out and to invite them, not only back into relationship, but to confess their sin. Right? Adam, where are you? Literally, what have you done? And until we're honest before God with the sin we know we're responsible for, he can't do a healing work in us. Until we fess up and come clean before him and we act like we haven't done anything, the blood of Jesus is to no avail in offering forgiveness to a heart that still doesn't understand their responsibility, their culpability in this great offense against a holy deity. And so God now in verse 14 is going to sentence two groups. There's the sentencing of Satan, which is the second blank in your notes. And then there's the sentencing of humanity. That's the first blank. So I don't want you to get confused, okay? We're actually going to deal with the sentence on humanity first. But let's read the passage starting at verse 14. It says this, And the Lord God said to the serpent, i.e. Lucifer, i.e. Satan, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Now, most of us, as we read that, we're like, oh, wow, I've heard these verses before. I've heard some of these themes before. And this morning, I get the opportunity and the privilege to unpack what is happening here because I think there's been a lot of confusion. I think there's been a lot of misinterpretation. So my role this morning is to help us understand what is actually happening here in this event in the garden some thousands of years ago and how does it impact our lives today so let's first deal with the sentence on humanity 
So the sentence on humanity is something we need to, to understand. This is a context of, of grace right here, right now. Because God deals graciously with these two rebels. I mean, let's just call them what they are, right? They were set up with free will in the garden. They chose to exert their free will against God's command, thus plunging themselves into an unalterable circumstantial situation. See, once man chose not to honor God, he condemned his will into bondage now, forever. Outside a work of God on their lives, they would forever be in a position where they could not love God, they could not worship God, they could not honor God, and yet this is why God has created us, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is why you have been created. This is why you are here. You have been designed for one purpose. It's not to work. It's not to get married. It's not to have kids. It's not to root for the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl. It's not to root for Tiger Woods to, to win the memorial. It's not for anything other than here's your purpose, to worship God. But outside a work of God on your heart, our hearts are hard and we don't want God. So God takes the initiative and shows us grace. He could have condemned man, woman into eternity apart from him, rebels to the end. And C.S. Lewis said it this way, and I love the picture. The doors of hell are locked on the inside. You do not have the ability to turn to God in and of your own strength. It takes an outside change from him to turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And he does that through Jesus Christ. So couch what I just said with the fact that he is delving out consequences to Adam and Eve with the spirit of I'm a loving father and I would, love to, I would rather die for you than live without you. I'd rather take the debt that you have incurred and I'd rather still maintain relationship with you though there's going to be consequences. And what are those consequences? There's two groups that we need to deal with this morning. The first is the woman and the pain with home. And the second is man and the pain with work. So Adam and Eve both sin against God. They have trusted in their goodness versus his. They've turned to their own wisdom except for his. And now they think being happy is living their lives the way they want to and not following God's instructions. So they reject his word. They eat the fruit. And they assert what we call moral autonomy. We'd rather have our will done than yours. And in exercising moral autonomy, they lose everything. And yet God is set to restore them. Now notice this. Woman and the pain with the home. Starting at verse 16. So to the woman he says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Literally, the word childbirth is conception. Now, it takes on an entirely different meaning because there's no pain involved with conception. Now, I hear there's great pain involved with childbirth. Amen, ladies? But there's no pain involved with conception. And what we have to understand, the word means the full range of motherhood. See, what we have to understand is that because of woman rebelling against God and exerting her will over his, the promise that you shall be fruitful and multiply now becomes a burdensome misery. That a woman is going to find so much of her identity in her relationships because that's how God has made her. Now her children and ultimately her marriage will not be what God has designed it to be apart from his work in her life. So the full range of motherhood will now be a painful process, not just bearing children and bringing them into the world, but now mothering those children and journeying with those children the rest of their lives. This is something that men do not understand because by nature, we're not nurturers. That doesn't mean we're off the hook, guys. But what it means is that there's a woman and, and, and her journey with her children is unique. 
when they feel pain, she feels pain. When they succeed, she succeeds. When they fail, she feels like she has failed. And what God says to her is now your journey with children will be a difficult one. And I'm sure there are mothers in this room right now that would say a hearty amen to that statement because while you may have children that have done well, some of you have children that haven't done well and you feel the pain of this. And so God says sin will now cause a disruption in your spirit because of your nurturing identity with your own children. Boy, I remember... uh, being with my mother-in-law during her final moments. And there had been some discord in, in the family. And there had been some disunity in the family. And there was nothing she wanted more before she died than to see these kids be reconciled. And I praise God that during her final moments, she saw her children together in one room being reconciled together. And I know for her... That was something that meant more than anything else. Here she was battling a terminal disease, cancer. And I'm sure more than even finding a a cure for cancer was seeing her own home become more harmonious together. This is something she passionately wanted. And God blessed her with seeing this before she passed from this world to the next. And yet God says, for ladies, for women, this is going to be a difficult journey. And you need to be reminded that your full satisfaction is not found in what your kids do, for better or for worse. You need to to understand that the, the dysfunction and the unhealth that sometimes mothers experience with their children is a result of the curse of sin and the fall. But ultimately, what you don't need to do is find your identity in your children. Your identity as a woman is found in Jesus Christ. And your kids, though you want to prepare them well and you want to pray for them and you want to continue to cultivate God in their hearts, ultimately God is the one doing the work on the inside. And for better or worse, you need to accept where your kids are at, continue to mother them and nurture them, but leave the results up to God. Because your identity is not how well you did as a mother. Your identity is found in the fact that you are loved by Jesus Christ. And this is something we need to navigate, and this is something we need to talk about, because making a life for a woman is so important, and she makes a life through her relationships. And what are her primary relationships? Her children and her husband. Generally speaking, this is the route most women will take. This is not saying that a woman can't work. This is not saying a woman can't be a leader. This is not saying anything like that. What this is saying is, generally speaking, throughout the ages, Women have a desire to be married and to have children and to make a life through those primary relationships we call the home. So now she's going to have difficulty and sorrow with children, being a mother. But notice the second piece in verse 16. You're going to have conflict with your husband. Now I'm just curious, who's had conflict with a spouse here in this this room this morning? This, and the rest of you are liars. I just hate that. <laughs> Either you're lying or you have not lived under the same roof together more than two hours. That's all I got to say. So now there's going to be sorrow with marriage. And there's going to be a struggle. Because the idea here is that Eve acted against what she had been instructed to do. Not eat from the tree. She was the primary player at the moment of enticement. But the greater responsibility falls on the husband who sits there by her side and doesn't say a darn thing. And permits his wife to do what he should have done. He should have stepped in and said, God gave me these instructions. This is what we're not supposed to do. And therefore, we won't do it. But she does it. She passes it to him. And he sits back. As a coward, taking the fruit which he was forbidden to eat. And now this is a picture of all the struggle that will now happen between a man and a woman. And I will tell you this. In counseling and mentoring and coaching couples, when men and women come together, whether they are planning to get married or whether they're already married, here is the source of conflict. 
The fact is that the man does not know how to lead in a God-honoring way his home. And when the man doesn't know how to lead, the wife will surely come right along and lead in light of the vacuum of his leadership. And this is just fraught with difficulties. Can I just, can I just save you guys a lot of hours of counseling and, and, and a lot of money spent on counselors right here, right now? Men, you must learn how to Christ-like initiate in your home. What God has set you up as a husband to do is to exemplify loving leadership like Christ would lead the home. However imperfectly that looks, you need to take, here's the word, the initiative. But men don't take the initiative because of one of two things. Either they have never been taught how to take the initiative, or they have taken the initiative and they've been shot down by their wives Hence, they almost feel emotionally emasculated that they can't be a leader in their home. And I'm telling you, there are strong women out there. I am married to a a type A stubborn woman, and I'm the same way. And boy, watching how God has been able to work in our relationship, it hasn't come without battles. It hasn't come without conflict. But one of the things that Lori has learned in the course of our 26 years together, and we still haven't graduated from this school, just to let you guys know, is that I must let my husband take the initiative and lead even if I don't agree with it. Even though maybe I don't see what he's seeing, I must let him do that. He's taking the initiative. He's showing that initiative. I must let him do that. And if he leads well and the choices he makes are good, then we all benefit. And if he chooses wrongly, I'm not going to be the person on the sideline saying, I told you so, but we're going to learn from the experience. See, I invite her into the marriage, as as far as I invite her into the conversation. We talk about decisions that need to get made, but she understands that I hold the primary responsibility, not the sole responsibility, it's the primary responsibility, to take the initiative for our family. And this means that I lean on her for wisdom, her expertise, but she cannot try to wrest control of the marriage from me because that's just going to ensue a battle. Just like you don't see up the 101 a car being driven by a husband and wife where there's two steering wheels. That doesn't happen, right? That car would either go like this and split right down the middle or it's just going to be swerving all the road and cause accidents. There's a reason why there's one steering wheel in a car and God has assigned the man, the husband, to sit behind the steering wheel. Does that mean he charts the course for wherever he wants to go and doesn't lean on his wife or his kids for for input? No. We talk about where we're going, but the responsibility is on the man. And yet when the man doesn't lead, that doesn't mean the woman steps in because here's the issue. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Your desire is going to be to wrest control. God bless you. And he is going to now rule over you so now what turns uh into a a relationship of conflict is due to the fact that he sees her vying for his position and he's already insecure because he doesn't know how to initiate and lead and that just leads to him now dominating her versus loving her and then they call us and go pastor scott lori can we meet with you because we don't know how to relate with each other And this is why I say when it all comes down to it, men need to stop acting like cowards and women need to stop acting like controllers. You can write that down. That's worth money right there. Someone's probably already said it. Women need to stop acting like controllers and men need to stop acting like cowards. Wives, give your husbands opportunity to learn. We don't come into this world with a BA degree in husbandry, knowing how to love our wives and lead our children. But we need to learn, and we don't need a woman to shoot us down. And men, you need to learn and pony up and learn what it means to lead your family like Jesus would lead your marriage and your children. And when there's unity and harmony in this pursuit together, no matter how imperfectly it looks in execution, we're still pursuing these things. Because Lord knows I have a lot to learn. Lord knows my wife has a lot to learn. And in 26 years, you would think we have it figured out. You will never figure it out till the day you die. 
and you're at the wedding supper of the Lamb, and you go, okay, this is what marriage looks like. Amen? I'm going to lean on my, my, my wife of wisdom. Is that, is that thumbs up? Yep. Cool. I like it. So sorrow with children. Sorrow with marriage. And, and let me just say with children, there is no guarantee, even if you raise your children in a Chris, Christian environment, they will love Jesus. Can I just say that right here, right now? The Proverbs have been misconstrued because the, 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 the words of Proverbs are not promises, they are principles. And if you raise up a child in the way he or she should go, the proverb says he or she shall not depart from it. That is not a carte blanche guarantee that your kids will love Jesus. That's just saying there is a principle that says, generally speaking, this is what will happen. But there is no guarantee as much as I want my children to know Jesus Christ, there's no guarantee they will. But you're the pastor. Yeah, but I don't have sovereignty over their hearts. I have no control over their will. I can point in the Jesus, and I can hopefully show the character of Jesus to them, but where their heart ultimately ends up being either with Christ or against Christ is up to God's sovereignty and his acting love upon them. So now the sorrow can be somewhat you know, taken, taken care of because now my responsibility is just to point my kids in the right direction and I'm not responsible for their choices and it's got to be a lot harder for a woman to make that disconnect than for a man. Because a man is not concerned about making a life. A man is concerned about making a living. This is why the consequences of sin are so important to understand here. So we are now navigating from the sorrow with children and the sorrow with marriage for a woman to now man and the pain with work. 16 tons, and what do you get? Another year older and deeper in debt, right? Like, that's the song that hangs over the male psyche, right? Like, we are going to spend how much of our life working? 75% of our life working? Is that what the statistics are? I, that's what it feels like in my life. And yet, men continue to be so discontented and so dissatisfied just like with a woman in her home there's so much dissatisfaction that comes because she puts her everything into it well now god turns to the man in verse 17 and says these words he says because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which i commanded you not to eat cursed is the ground because of you in toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life thistles and thorns will come forth from the ground and you're going to eat of the plants and by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread so now like with the woman right so here's the command be fruitful and multiply but now that is going to carry more misery because of sin well now the subdue the earth and rule over it command in genesis 2 is going to have much more misery involved too because now it's going to involve two things there is now with man in his work unrewarding toil and secondly, an unrelenting terror. Terror. T-E-R-R-O-R. I'm glad you guys weren't in the spelling bee this last week. So in the same way that a woman's punishment struck at the deepest root of her being as a woman, wife, and mother, this man's curse strikes at the innermost nerve of his life, which is his work, his activity, and his provision for sustenance. So now there's this perpetual pain that exists within us as humans. Like I said, here's the desire for a woman to make a life. Here's the desire for a man to make a living. It is not going to be the same because now the ground, which was yielding nothing but good stuff, will now be cursed because of man's disobedience. And now there is unrewarding toil. Work will be burdensome. It will be difficult. I hate, I mean, living in Arizona, I don't think gets you any closer to this curse than anywhere else in the world. I mean, how many of you have been outside and you're like, I just swept these weaves the other, uh, leaves the other day. I just wiped this dust off the counter just yesterday. Boy, I got the 10th poke from that thorn that are this big, right, hanging off these trees. You and I, if you do yard work, feel the curse. You feel the effects of these things. And generally speaking, God says, now for men, you will continue to toil and it will be unrewarding. 
there will be frustration with your work. And I will tell you, apart from God, no man's work, no man's achievements will fully satisfy him. This is, this is the curse that men will in, be involved so much in their work that they will continue to be unsatisfied because work was never meant to give you what only God could give you. This is like why, why the words of, of the, the, the wisdom poetry in the Bible is so remarkable. If you don't know the wisdom poetry, books like Job and Psalm and Proverbs and Song of Solomon and, and Ecclesiastes. Here's what Job chapter 7 says. Let me just see if this resonates with us. Has not man a hard service on earth and are not his days like the days of a hired hand? Like a slave who longs for the shadow and like a hired hand who looks for his wages. Job is speaking here of the difficulty of work and not finding satisfaction in it all. Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, he writes these words in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He says, starting at verse uh, 3, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And the words that precede this and come after it are, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Right? Are you going to become the cynic like Solomon, who then continues what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Here's what Ecclesiastes, whatever my eyes desire, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for I found, my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Listen to this, here's the cynic. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Thank goodness he is not our, like, success coach, right? Thank goodness he's not going around doing seminars like, how you can enjoy your work, right? Like, here's the spirit of the wisest, richer man, richest man that ever lived, and here's what he says. Nothing I put my hands to. Nothing I bought with the things I had, I had the money I had made, the resources I had. Nothing brought me satisfaction. It is all a chasing after the wind. You feel like that? You feel like that as, as men and even women could probably identify with this too, that there's this idea that we spend so much of our life working and the question is to what end? And there's something that groans within us. There's, there's something that the earth is subjected to and it's groaning. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. Look at verses 19 through, through 22. Paul says these words, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, the, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Right? What an amazing way to, to picture what we live in day in and day out. The fact that the, the, the earth groans and, and man has now caused the earth to groan, that which yielded fruit, that which yielded vegetation, now yields thorns and thistles as a result of man's disobedience. And now we are cursed to work the land. Work is not a curse. Let me be clear. But now the, the work is going to be more difficult. See, work was given to man before the fall, right? Work was given to man before sin entered the world. We need to devote ourselves to work, but now it's going to become more burdensome. And how much more now to remember the words of Colossians chapter 3, where Paul says, do your work heartily as unto the Lord. Don't come to me complaining about your boss. Don't come to me complaining how, how hard your work is. You come to me and say, pray for my heart. To with, with an unloving and uncaring boss and a difficult work environment to honor God in that place at those moments. Amen? See, we have an opportunity to now leverage our children, our marriages, our work in a way that glorify God. And so now there's this unrewarding toil that we are now devoted to do. And you may not be paid back for your investment. Rarely. Will you get what you expect from work? It's just like the guy who, if you didn't hear about this last week, he, uh, he was training for this half marathon, and he gets down to the race uh, area where everyone's kind of you know corralled together, and he had been training for this half marathon for a long time. Well, he gets in the, the line, get, the race starts, 
and he realizes he's in the full marathon race, not the half marathon race. The half marathon race had already started like an hour ago. And so he gets in the full, so he runs, right? And at this time, he's trained for a half marathon. He hits the half marathon mark and goes, I'm in. I might as well continue. He finishes the full marathon. And he goes to get his medal, which everyone was awarded a medal. And they give him the half marathon medal, not the full marathon medal. Why? Because he had registered for the half marathon. Even though he ran the full one. Does that feel like work sometimes? Like, don't I go above and beyond? Don't, don't I sweat? Don't I bleed? Don't I, like, and yet, this is how I'm rewarded for my hard work, and we can identify with that runner in that North Dakota marathon. That we will rarely get from this world what we expect it to give us. But the guarantee is this, that God sees our work. He sees our labor. He sees our perseverance with the things that are assigned to us. And we should work heartily as unto the Lord because he is our boss. He is the one we're accountable to. And doggone it, I'm going to do the best job even though I may have a jerk of a boss. Amen? Amen. I may have the work, work, worst work environment. It's, it's not a change of circumstances you need. It's a security in your heart that God sees and he will reward. And so this is encouragement for us as men that we will be involved in unrewarding toil. This is part of the curse. But as far as it depends upon me, I'm going to honor God. But then there's this fact of unrelenting terror that hangs over us. The reason we work and the reason we try to find so much from our work is that the very ground that we're subjected to work is the very ground that cries out to us and says, I will hold your remains one day. You will eventually die. And when we hold dirt in our hands, there's something inside our spirits that says, we are dust ourselves and we're going to return to that place. And the ground reminds us of our mortality. The ground reminds us that we are not designed to function like this, that sin has now brought this curse of death over us. And let me talk about death, because that's a really encouraging thing to talk about on a Sunday morning. So let's talk about death, and I want you to write three words down. I want you to write physical, I want you to write spiritual, and I want you to write eternal. Because this Bible speaks of three types of death. And they're all important to focus on, and, and let me address the, the spiritual death first. And I gave them to you out of order, so I apologize for that. So, spiritual death. This is the death that man and woman experienced right off the bat when it came to their act of disobedience. Because the, the, the warning was, if you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. Well, they ate of the fruit and didn't die physically, but what had died was the most important part of their humanity, and that is their spiritual relationship with God. This is why they hid in shame. This is why they hid in guilt is because now they had plunged themselves spiritually into death and now there was not a heart awareness or a heart that even cared for God. So there's spiritual death, that which happens to every single born into this world because we're born sinners and no one loves God and no one seeks after God, so we're all spiritually dead, even though we're physically alive. So it's kind of like the walking dead or night of the living dead, whatever you know, picture you want to imagine in your head. People are out there functioning, but they're not functioning from a spirit that's alive because we're all spiritually dead. But God makes us alive in Christ, amen, Ephesians chapter 2. But then there's physical death. The fact that all of us have hanging over us the fact that we will die. Like one comedian said, I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens, right? We can all relate with the fact that as we get older, and this is the weird thing, is that people die. Like, I, I'm in my late 40s, right? And it seems like, like I get these messages. I got a text message this morning from someone I used to work with, and they said, hey, so-and-so died. I'm going, am I now at that age where now the, the news I get are people dying that I went to school with or people I used to work with? Like, and yet it's this, it's this haunting specter that hangs over us, that we are mortal creatures. And from the ground God has created us, and to the ground we will return. And so now there's this idea of physical death, and we try to fight against it. 
We try to create the fountain of youth products, right? Like if you drink this, you're going to, you know, tack on 40 years of your life. Or if you eat this green, whatever it is that's growing that tastes like cardboard with some salt on it, you're going to extend your life 60 years. And all these promises to remain vital and young. And, and yet we all realize deep down inside that God has set eternity in our hearts and we're going to die. And so there's spiritual death, there's physical death, and then there's eternal death which is the death that I want every single person to avoid. The fact is that we do not live once, and that's it. You, you die once, and then you go to live forever, right? The people that say, oh, you only live once, I follow it up with, and then you live forever, right? YOLO, yeah, YOLO, and then forever. The idea that this world, we are just passing through, and it's preparation for the other world. This is why Jesus came back from death to tell us that there is another realm of existence, that we are creatures that will exist for eternity. The question is, where will you spend eternity? Will it be with God or will it be apart from God? Will it be in a, a place where there's condemnation and there's judgment because of the fact that you wanted to be your own God and you chose to resist the one true God? Well, there is eternal death for those who reject Christ. With the promise, there's eternal life for those who accept Christ. And so, and I know, I totally agree with you, man. Kobe's got it. He knows. He's tracking with me. So, so there's unrewarding toil, and then there's unrelenting care. And let me just tell you, for, we, for us as men and women to always foster our heart to be reminded that there is a world to come, there is a life to come, that we are merely passing through in preparation for eternity. Jesus is the ticket. Let's live for his glory and prepare our hearts for that place. All that to say, now let me couch it in the most beautiful news I can give you this morning. And that's the sentence on Satan. Look at verses 14 and 15 again. Because we need to talk through two things. Number one, Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this. Now notice, there is no promise. There is no blessing. There's no grace. There's no questioning, right? There's no inviting in the conversation. See, what the enemy has done was something he had already done behind the scenes in the eternal realm when he thought he could elevate himself above God and God cast him out of heaven. And he took a third of the angels with him who that thus would be current be turned into demons see the enemy is smart the enemy is beautiful the enemy is crafty and now on earth the enemy tries to do what he tried to do in heaven but what he doesn't realize is that he will now be judged for his actions and the place of judgment will be the world that god created now check this out verse 14 because you have done this cursed are you more than all the cattle more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life now i'm going to tell you right now again this is a judgment on part of God's creation. Satan is part of God's creation. More crafty than anything that had been created, any cattle, any beast. This is why I don't think there was some snake that popped up in the garden. I don't think there was this, this snake that all of a sudden had legs and was walking around like, you know, with a top hat, like, hey, listen to my words, listen to my wisdom, follow my way. I think what we are dealing with here is the presence of Satan in the garden part of God's created order, who is beautiful, who is shining, who is shimmering. He is this angel light sent to deceive, and he is the one who is now cursed. And notice the curse. It involves the enemy's continual humiliation, right? Like, he will try to rise up and lead people astray, but he is condemned to a position of subjugation, degradation, humiliation right there is nothing the enemy does that is not within the counsel of god remember satan is god satan and he is on a leash and the length of that leash is determined by god he is not like god in being omniscient and omnipresent and and you know he doesn't have the qualities that god has he is a limited being and yet when he acts it seems like he's bigger than he really is but he is a creature subject to humiliation. 
and the words that you will be on your belly and you will eat dust. See, what we, don't, what we know is that snakes don't eat dirt. This is not their food. This is not their sustenance. This is figurative language saying you will now occupy a place of humiliation. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. See, this, the enemy, Satan, will try to defeat your spirit. He'll try to destroy your joy. And because you're more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ, according to the words of Romans, you do not have to listen to the lies. You do not have to listen to the deceitful half-truths. And this is the scary thing about Satan, right? He can speak truth, but it's truth that's tainted with falsehood. This is why sometimes the words of Satan are so identical to the words of God, and yet there's something that's amiss in them. This is why Satan is so crafty, and he's smart, and he's wise, right? See, the demons have faith, James says, and they shudder. Why? Because they understand how powerful faith is, but they don't have a faith that saves. They don't have a faith that believes, but they know that those who have faith in God and that his word, his, word, his truth is, is trustworthy and dependable, Satan tries to come in and masquerade himself as this giver of truth. And the only way to counter the works of the enemy and humiliate him in our daily practice is just like Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4 in the temptations in the wilderness. You've got to confront the enemy with God's word with his truth the only offensive weapon given to us by god in ephesians chapter 6 where paul says put on the armor of god you've got your breastplate of righteousness you've got your shield of faith right you've got your helmet of salvation well the only offensive weapon given to you is the sword and is the sword of the spirit of the word of god and the more you sow the word of god in your heart the less the voice of Satan tries to influence you. Amen? Most of us, if not all of us, can relate to this, can identify with this, that now this creature is subject to continual humiliation. But that's not just the good news. Here's the greater good news. The second point, the enemy's ultimate defeat. And can I tell you, this is one of the most remarkable places in all the scripture because in verse 15, is the first mention of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Circle verse 15 of Genesis 3, because we need to unpack this, and we're going to dovetail this into next week's message as well. Look at verse 15. Here's what it says. And I will put enmity. There will be hostility between you and the woman. Now stop right there. There is going to be a struggle. And that struggle will exist on three levels. There's an immediate level, there is a collective level, and there's an ultimate level. The immediate level is that she is going to give birth to two boys, and their names are Cain and Abel. And we know how those two got along with each other, right? And we'll talk about that here in a bit. She will feel the effects of this enmity in her own household, where one brother will murder another brother. So she will understand what this judgment means in her own home. Secondly, on a collective level, there is what we need to understand, two groups of humanity in the world. And it's not Republicans and Democrats. The two groups of humanity in this world are those that are born of the seed of God and those who are born of the seed of the enemy. Jesus in John 8 was very severe in telling the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious leaders that they were of their father, the devil. Now, how's that about influencing friends and, and winning people over to your side? See, there are those that are born into this world and they will never know the seed of the spirit, which is imperishable, that brings life. And so when it comes to two humanities, Jesus taught about this. There's the wheat and the tares. There's the sheep and the goat. There are those who are born of God and those who are not. And in a collective sense, this is what is encouraging. For those who are born of the seed of the Spirit in Jesus Christ, which is imperishable, according to Peter, right? We are all part of the same family. We're part of the same team. And there's a collective sense that because God has chosen us, he has adopted us, Doggone it, we can encourage each other till the day draws, clear, draws near, right? 
that there's hope together. There's a reason why we come to this powwow on Sunday morning. I'm going to call it a powwow. This is the locker room meeting, right? The game's been happening. We need a break. We need to hear from the coach. We need to know what the game plan is. And we are part of the seed of the Spirit. Praise God for his love for us. And we come together to remind us that this is the community that matters. There's another community that is being influenced by the enemy that is warring against us, and we feel the conflict. See, not only with Cain and Abel, but there's conflict between the seed of the Spirit through Jesus Christ and the seed that is ultimately influenced by the enemy. There is a battle going on, according to Ephesians chapter 6, in the unseen realm that we do not fully understand, that we do not fully see, but we feel it. This is why we continue to remind ourselves of our identity as being children of the seed of the promise. Which brings us to the ultimate promise. Notice how the writer, verse 15, spells it out for us. And I do not want you to miss this. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Circle this verse. This is the first promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because here's what I want you to know. Some very unique imagery going on here. Two things with her seed. Her seed is masculine in language, which means it is referring to a man but it is her seed, which is unorthodox because the woman in con conception doesn't provide the seed. Man provides the seed. And what Genesis 3.15 is saying is that there will come a time when a woman will produce a seed, which biologically is impossible because she provides the egg, the man provides the seed, but she is going to bring forth the seed, and that seed will be male, and that seed is going to do something to the, to the serpent and his offspring, and what is it going to be? It will destroy and crush its head. Even though it will bite him on the heel, there will be a more fatal blow done to him than what he does to her seed. And the transaction of what this event is pointing to, because this is not only the first promise, this is the first prophecy found in Genesis in the entire Bible. It is pointing to a hill called Golgotha, where at the cross, Satan thinks he has won the battle. But in the end, the cross leads to the resurrection of Christ. Yes, Satan bit him on the heel, but it was merely a scratch. It was merely a flesh wound. And ultimately, on the third day, Jesus would conquer death, sin, and the grave by triumphing through his resurrection and crushing a fatal blow to the head of the serpent. That is awesome! That is why Colossians 2, the passage Jorgen referred to during communion, is such a wonderful reminder. Look at verses 13, 14, and 15. Paul writes this to the church at Colossae. He says in verse 13, that, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, right? Because we're in, unable to do anything God wants us to do. God now steps in, makes us alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Amen by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers. He disarmed the authorities. And he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Christ is his, he's all. He is everything. He is prince. He is master. He is lord. He is conqueror. Christus victus, Latin for Christ is the victor. And though the enemy thought he had the last laugh, he continues to exist in a realm of self-deception and doesn't realize it is God who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And that on the earth, at the cross, the final transaction will be taken care of. Christ will be victorious and Satan will be crushed. Ladies and gentlemen, the war is over. Ladies and gentlemen, the war is done. And yet, we don't experience the full force of that reality. Because even though the war is over, there are still little battle skirmishes that take place. 
but greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And in Christ, you are made more than a conqueror. If you've been adopted into his family and you are by faith a child of the seed of the spirit of Christ, you are secure. Not only are you a soldier in God's army and given the equipment to defeat the works of the enemy, even though he is defeated, you have been promised family relationship. You're a son and daughter by adoption and eternity is yours secured because of Jesus' sacrificial death. What more can I say? What more can I say? Satan is like the villain falling out of the high rise, falling to his death while trying to shoot as many people as he can going down. You know the scene from the action movies, right? The guy is going to die, but he's going to try to take out as many people as he can. Praise God for God's sovereignty over the entire course of events we call human history. And not only past, but future. Your future is secured. Because there's a victor named Christ who is seated right now at the right hand of the Father. And the promise is that he will put all of Christ's enemies as a, as a footstool for him to put his legs up on. He's chilling. He's chilling. There's nothing to fear. Because he's conquered every enemy. So be reminded of who you are in Christ. That the ultimate defeat has happened. And one day he is going to come back and he will consummate his relationship with you. He will finalize his work against the adversary. And for some reason, beyond our understanding, he will make every wrong right because everything is designed for God's glory. How that's all going to work out, I don't know. But I'm going to rest in Christ in the meantime and forever. Amen? I got nothing else for you guys. That's good news, man. And I'm going to tell you, this is going to dovetail into next week as we finish out Genesis chapter 3. Because the promise and the words of God's grace will continue to pour over us. And we can't help but be elated and exhilarated and excited that we are not left as abandoned orphan children, but we are loved by a God who cares for us for more than we could ever imagine. In and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Children are getting restless. And by children, I mean you guys. No, I'm just kidding. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. For the promises. For the prophecies. For the truth that is designed to set us free. Thank you for your word which is designed to remind us that this is not necessarily about our need. This is about your power to rule over your creation. Lord, we praise you for meeting us in our place of need, but we also thank you for being a sovereign God who is in control of all things and will ultimately leverage everything for your glory. Help us to be a participant in that. May we live lives for your glory. May we live lives that point to the reality of Jesus Christ. May we point to the reality that we, who are worthy of condemnation, have received freedom because of the Savior's love for us. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this family. Thank you for this community. Thank you for your faithful love, which will never end toward us. And it's all because of Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. You guys have an awesome day, all right? We'll see you soon. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the church is a verb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.